So we are week seven. We'll be covering chapters 27 and 28. It's all about blood and it's all about GI conditions. Um, I'm going to be doing the PowerPoint. If we have time, I have a 30 question cahoots. Of course, if we don't get to the cahoots, of course, I'll send it to you. But I'm trying to really try to make that possible. Uh, there is another CJ Sims. Remember, they are weighed heavily in this course. So get them done. Be careful when you submit. I need to see your name in the upper right hand corner. I need who you did the Sims on, your grade, and the date it was done. Those four things must be there. And it has to be in some format that I can open. Now, if you see a zero or still do not see a grade, it means I need something from you. You submit it on time. No deduction will be made, but I need something different, okay? So if you see I, I a have message, a question. try. Yes, Demetria. Um, Because I already took this class last semester, so do I have to do it over? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was remarked by Dean Brown even this morning at a meeting when I was with her. So yes, Demetria, it's just a refresh of it. So please uh, redo them. Okay, okay, so I just resubmitted it. Can you just ignore the one that I just submitted again today? I'll just um, do it over and submit it again. That is not a problem. I will. Okay. Okay. So again, remember we are week seven. Next week is Gobble Gobble Turkey Day. So I wish you all a really happy, healthy Thanksgiving. And I hope you're there with at least friends and family to enjoy it, no matter what you call Thanksgiving. I taught my children it isn't a day in November on a Thursday. It's every day where you have a roof over your head, you have friends and family around you, and food on your plate. Even if it's a McDonald's cheeseburger divided in half, doesn't matter. It's that is what Thanksgiving is all about. So I, I wish you all a blessed Thanksgiving. So let's go ahead and let's start with our PowerPoint today. And um, it's 110 slides. It's quite a bit, but uh, let's make the best of it. Let's try to figure out what we're talking about. So. Conditions of the blood, blood forming organs, lymphatic system. All right, it's a lot of different things to talk about, uh, but let's get going there. So blood dyscrasias, what is that? That means something happens that the blood is not being produced the way it should. We know that some are irregularly shaped, right? Sickle cell, thalassemias. We also know that sometimes the bone marrow doesn't produce what it should. So here's some definitions in here. So we know that red blood, belt, red blood cells are formed in the marrow of the long bones. And it's what we call hematopoiesis. It's the formation of blood in these bone marrows. Uh, and it could be, of course, any of the bone marrows. Now, red blood cell is all about erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is made by the liver. And then at first with the baby, so they have something. And then the kidneys take over. That's why in kidney failure, your red blood cells, your hemoglobin hematocrits tend to be low because the uh, erythropoietin is not being formed. So we can give injections, sub-Q injections of erythropoietin, and it will stimulate those red blood cells for being formed. Now, the lymphatic system is everything that drains all of infections and the body is trying to overtake them and kill them. And uh, it just drains them sort of things. Now, when we see, especially in children, the only time we see lymph nodes enlarged, especially like in the necks, is we always feel on the neck, right? For those lymph nodes. I mean, they're under the arms, they're in the groins. But when a kid gets sick, oh, their neck, their their glands are swollen, we say. Well, that's indicative, yes, there is an infection. Because normally, a child's not going to have those big uh, enlarged lymph nodes. The other thing that has to do with infection is the spleen. And the spleen is one of the major things um, that um, 
helps with the lymphatic system. It, um, when you're not feeling well, um, when you have um, mononucleosis, which is a viral disease, that spleen enlarges really, really big and we have to protect it because it's trying to take care of that infection in there. Um, but it enlarges when we see that, just like the neck enlarges, the spleen enlarges. So the blood has a bunch of stuff in it, right? It's plasma, which is the liquid. And then we have erythrocytes, which is your red blood cells, right? And we have leukocytes, which fight infection, your, um, the WBCs, and thrombocytes, platelets. And that has to do with blood coagulopathy. That means you cut, you're going to stop bleeding because platelets are going to be like that Band-Aid and stop it, okay? The erythrocytes carry oxygen and food, iron, to the body. That's erythrocytes. And as I said, leukocytes, white cells, all about infection. And we know lymphocytes are produced um, in order to take care of that infection. That's why when we have them over and over again in upper respiratory and we get diseases, our body builds antibodies. It's because our lymphocytes are being produced specific to kill that germ, that bacteria, that virus, whatever it is, it's the body's trying to work. Now anemias can be caused by many things. It could be they're not produced, they're irregularly produced, or they die quickly. All of those things can happen in it. So your hemoglobin and your hematocrit will be low. No matter what, the word anemia means a low blood count. Well, what did I tell you was carried in the hemoglobin? red blood cells. And what does the red blood cells carry? Oxygen and iron. So if you have a low count, you don't have much oxygen and you don't have much iron, your energy level is going to be extremely low, okay? Which means they don't have any energy. They're pale. They're sleepy all the time. They're not a normal kid. When you see a kid like that, we're going to be checking that CBC to see what their hemoglobin matocrit is. They say a hemoglobin in a child below eight results in that heart saying, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to beat faster. I'm going to try to get it around. But it also shunts away from certain things. So your body's not getting all the iron and oxygen it needs. And that will end up in those paler weakness, tachycardia, shortness of breath, and your heart's not going to end up failing from working so hard. So you go into congestive failure. So does that make sense to you about what anemia is? So iron deficient anemia, most common, and it's all nutritional. And we know children, green leafy vegetables and proteins, well, they don't really always want that. They just want that chicken nugget and macaroni and cheese. I've heard that over and over again by so many uh, parents um, in the pediatric world. But, you know, there are ways to trick these kids today. Uh, we're really lucky. They have fruit juices that are all vegetables and you could get those things into them. You know, I was blessed with children who love salad and a baked potato it was their favorite, favorite meal. And my grandson loves broccoli, loves lettuce, loves green beans. He's a crazy guy. And I'll pick that in front of a lot of other stuff, including candy. So um, eating and being iron deficient, it's not his problem. But how do we correct it? Well, if we are not getting enough of what we need, the heart's going to work harder, burn calories. You're burning calories, you're going to see a child who's not going to grow the way that they should, right? So we want to make sure that we give enough um, iron to our children, iron, uh, iron fortified formulas, iron formula uh, fortified cereals. We give those in the first year of life. Sometimes we give an iron supplements, depending. And one of the things that um, some parents that they just don't understand, um, they give cow's milk um, and to young infants and infants just can't tolerate. This is, um, natural. It's not mom's milk. It's different. Um, and it can lead to a lot of problems. Um, also, uh, you're, they're not getting antigens or nothing from it. So nutritionally, they'll be depleted, but it also leads to bleeding. 
So what do you see? Again, tired, irritable. They might be be confused depending on how low that uh, level is because is that oxygen getting to the brain, right? Part of it. You're going to see that elevated heart rate and tachypnea and just really being tired, okay? Now, what do you do? How do you test? Well, the first thing that we do with anything dealing with blood is a CBC. And the CBC tells us a lot of different things. Um, it'll tell us what our numbers are, what, you know, is good, what's bad, what we need to change. And of course we can do iron levels. And the one thing in any anemia that we have to rule out is we have to rule out that there's no bleeding in the GI tract. So a stool for occult blood is always done. One of the initial things that we do for children. Now iron is given, remember iron, um, if we give it with orange juice, it speeds up the way it's absorbed. You never, ever, ever give it with milk because milk coats the stomach and iron needs the stomach acid to break it down to be used. Remember that there are questions on HESI's NCLEX exams regarding that concept of how the iron is broken down. We're taught, you know, we should do it in a straw, right? Older kids, we don't want to uh, stain their teeth, all right? So iron's important. Um, we can replace it by diet. If you can't do diet, we're going to be giving either liquid or even IM iron we can give. And um, we know that if you don't have enough iron, your body's not going to be fed. You're going to see a smaller child and cognitively they're not being fed they're gonna be delays. And that's just part of nutrition. Nutrition, the way I always talk about. Nutrition, most important thing we can do. So breastfeeding should be, if possible, the first six months. And if not, that iron fortified formula through the first year should be given. As I said, the um, iron, we don't give it with milk. And tell those parents, that stool is going to color, the, the color of the stool is going to change. It almost will turn black and sticky like. So these parents will think, oh my God, my kid, there's something's going on. My kid's dying. They used to have little brown stools and now they're black and sticky. Um, this is part of the iron that they've given, okay? And again, irons in between meals, as I said. You like a nice empty stomach. You want that gastric juices to work. And if they're old enough, um, if they can have orange juice, give them some orange juice with it. So there's two types of sickle cell. There's a trait and there's a disease. Now, a trait means that you have the ability uh, to produce a child with sickle cell. If two parents have a trait, each child, each pregnancy has 25% chance of getting it, okay? Now, there is two types of sickle cell disease. Some that don't, um, more you know, sickle cell anemia is the one that don't usually appear till mom's blood has gone away, right? And we know that mom's blood eventually will die. And then the body about six months old, you'll start um, making their own cells and they might start making sickle cells. And that's when you're going to see um, things like they're getting tired. Uh, these cells die quickly. So they're going to be seeing that anemia and that tiredness, and maybe the color and maybe because uh, we know we go to the pediatrician a lot in that first year, right? A lot of immunizations are given um, and every sniffle, they're usually there at the, the pediatrician and they weigh that child every time. So we'll be really looking at that growth, right? I mean, as they get older, you might see, you know, that little swelling of the fingers and toes only because the blood is stuck there because of those sickles. They get stuck in little tiny capillaries, okay? So we know that sickle cell disease is this sickle-shaped cells, and um, it doesn't have much oxygen as we want in it. Um, and it usually flows through the body well 
until a child is slightly dehydrated. The vessels get smaller. These sickle shapes can't get through all the bifurcations of all the vessels. And it gets stuck and then the cells go behind it and it clumps up. That's why there's swelling and pain and redness because blood can't go down. And then distally below that, you know, let's say it's in the knee, the toes are getting numb and getting pale and you have poor capillary refill because blood's not getting down there through one of the main vessels down there. So dehydration constriction of vessels. Also, what about cold weather? Cold weather, if you're cold, is also going to cause vasoconstriction. Again, how do we take care of this? Well, we keep these kids hydrated. We keep these kids warm. And that's going to help with a lot of sickle cell crises. I mean, there's other things that cause it, but the main thing is small vessels due to dehydration or that cold. So it can lead to... Um, the hemosideriosis, which is iron deposits in the body organ. Remember, these are small, they burst quickly, and we have iron. Now, thalassemia is worse than sickle cell with this iron. I mean, it's something to be watched, but um, it's not as much as thalassemia. <clears throat> so manifestations, what do you see? Well, these children come in into the emergency room, which you know that's the last 10 years of my career. It was a children's pediatric trauma center. And we would see them come in and their hemoglobin matocrits were always six, seven. Um, if they were seven, I'd be happy. Um, very pale, tired, uh, in a lot of pain, hurting. And the pain could be anywhere, remember. It could be in a knee, any joint, um, chest they have, abdomen. Remember, it can also go to the head. So just be aware that sickle cells can happen in the head. So if we're having headaches, we would be neuro checking really quick, telling that doctor all about those sort of things. So there's vasoocclusive, splenic questration, an aplastic crisis, and hyperhemolytic type of sickle cell crises. All right. So erythropoietin and some chemo can help increase the production of hemoglobin. So hopefully we'll get the good hemoglobin going. Now, in sickle cell, um, we don't just go ahead and say, all right, these cells are coming from the spleen and we're going to take it out. We don't recommend it for that. Their thalassemia, they do. This one, they don't, okay? Differences in different shaped cells. Um, the big thing with sickle cells, keeping them hydrated. Remember infections with fever burn extra fluid. So we need to make sure we keep extra fluid giving to that child to help open those veins and getting it through, okay? And we know if there is iron in the body, and it's going to organs and depositing, we know that can cause bad, bad things, you know, seizures, convulsions, all those things. So we need to keep the iron down. There is oral medicine called defloxamine. And what it does, it goes in the blood, through the organs, collects iron, and then you just urinate it out. So, but it requires a parent and the child to be diligent um, and going to their doctor's offices. So during a routine clinic visit, the nurse notes that an 18 month old child is pallid skin, that means they're pale, appears lethargic and is overweight. They have no energy, they're not moving, right? The mother says the child has become less active and increasing irritable. What condition should the nurse suspect? What does that sound like? We don't see it at birth, we see it later when the, the baby's own uh, body starts making blood. That's sickle cell, pale, tired. You're pale and tired, you're not moving, they're eating and they will gain weight because they're not moving. Um, less irritable, um, less active. Irritability is hypoxemia, right? All of those things fit in there. 
So what education is appropriate? Well, we need to um, find that CBC, see what's going on, keep them well hydrated, keep them warm, um, and follow up with lab values on their CBCs. Um, and also we're gonna be following up um, on their iron levels. So as I said, thalassemia, very similar to your sickle cell. Now sickle cell is a big C, it's a sickle. Thalassemia, I call them the rectangles. And these tend to die quickly. So these cells, even quicker than sickle cell, the rectangular cells, thalassemia tends to burst quickly. And inside red blood cells, again, is oxygen and iron. So oxygen's going away, iron is being disputed in the body. So now we have high iron levels, higher than sickle cell. So there are several types. We call them the minor or the major. Major is what we call Cooley's anemia. And usually when we are testing, um, looking at, and they say thalassemia, they're usually saying it's the Cooley's anemia, the major, okay? So there is again a thalassemia trait, which we call it the minor. We will see a little bit of issues with it, a little anemia, um, and maybe their spleen is a little bit uh, enlarged. As I said, thalassemia, they're more apt to take the spleen out than the sickle cell, okay? So probably a spleen will be coming out. These on a minor usually have no problem. They follow their iron levels, they follow their hemoglobin, they do what they need to do, and usually they go along and they're just fine. They don't get to the point of being pale and lethargic and irritable like um, uh, could be if it was that Cooley's anemia. Again, if we knew everybody's genetics, you know, and had genetic testing before having a baby, we would know, you know, if they were carriers or not, but we don't always know it. Now, thalassemia major is when the baby is born with um, this thalassemia genes, okay? Usually we see it, again, the second six months of life. Why the second six months of life? Mommy's stuff is gone. It's died. Cells don't live forever. So now the baby's producing it. Now we're starting to see it. And again, we start seeing the kid looking pale, irritable, hypoxic, short of breath, right? Um, and because they have no energy, they're short of breath, they're not gonna eat. And sometimes they do have a fever with that, sometimes not. Because it gets um, with into the liver, it enlarges, the spleen grows also, we might see some jaundicing, you know, from the liver there. Okay, because of these cells being stuck up in to, to the liver and the iron in there creates that going on, okay? With that, your tummy gets distended, abdominal distension, and then you start seeing like this chest pressure um, with these children. And because again, it's anemia, because the heart's trying to make up for the blood by beating faster, again, this one will go in a heart failure quicker actually than sickle cell because these die quicker. You do see some different looks on these children. Um, it's hard to find some pictures that really show it, but the teeth go overgrowth um, uh, of the upper jawbone. It seems to go over the, the bottom cheek. One of those things that you do see. Um, we do know that um, some of the bones and bone marrow areas are, are misshaped, but they do have a distinctive look to them. Usually we diagnose it because somewhere in the family we've seen it. Um, and what we do is we follow it up looking at bone growth, seeing if their bones are growing properly. It has to do with the marrow, it has to do with oxygen, it has to do with iron, all of those things. And then a hemoglobin electrophoresis is what we actually look at to figure out what type of thalassemia does this child have. Our goal in therapy is to try to prevent 
all of these deformed cells. Um, you want to keep hemoglobin levels. Um, many times they'll take the spleen out because they're overproducing cells that are just going to burst, burst. They're also going to spew that iron into the system, which is toxic. So we tried to just get rid of the spleen um, and let the body work. And this uh, child will require transfusions. Cooley's anemia is trans, uh, all these transfusions uh, that will be given. So um, that's thalassemia major. Now, there's, you know, you look at these, um, there are some areas now, Mediterranean, Mediterranean people actually is where this comes from. Um, we know sickle cell is African-American. Um, so we know sometimes that can help us with clues, but you'll see in the Mediterranean little clinics with all the kids lined up getting their blood transfusions. Um, because as, as I said, again, their cells burst quickly. Um, they're, they're produced, but it doesn't last long and it goes away quickly. So we try to keep the hemoglobin matocrit up and we do that with the transfusions. Uh, but we also have got to really watch the iron because even though they're getting transfusion, the body still makes cells at other different areas. It's just not the spleen. We got bone marrow everywhere, right? So what they do is, again, give Desferol. And again, it takes the iron, gets a hold of it, and it um, brings it out through the uh, kidneys and they urinate it out, okay? So thalassemia, big thing is transfusions and worry about iron, iron chelating therapy. So these children can live a, a pretty long time, but it is, you know, sometimes it's a couple times a week, um, transfusions depending, or once a week, or uh, following up to the doctor and getting labs or getting Desferol treatment, or it can go even more uh, um, in depth than that. But these children can live a pretty normal life. But again, they've got to keep hydrated and they really need close, close monitoring with them. And, you know, these children are always being stuck for, you know, labs and IVs, et cetera. So making sure that we take care of not only the child, but the family. The family has to bring them to all these visits, right? Now, hemophilia. You think of hemophilia, you think of somebody who bleeds and doesn't clot, right? It is coming from actually the mom, the X chromosome. Um, and it's, uh, we uh, find this out, we can do, you know, tests to look for it. Um, but usually hemophilia, um, it's one of those things that is inherited. We don't find it right away. It's usually when we see bleeding going on with them, or we have an understanding one of the parents, the mother has the gene um, and we'll be looking for it. So hemophilia is due to, there are certain things in the blood that you need that clot the blood when you get a cut. So when you get bruised, so you don't just keep bruising and bruising. Um, there's something that says, okay, I've had enough. Let's, let's get that clot out. Let's get the platelets out and let's clot the blood. Usually when we think of it, it's a factor eight. There's more than that, but factor eight, is just a, a good example of it. Now, how do we check for hemophilia A? Well, what we do is a test that we would take if we were looking at heparin. Heparin is monitored by a PTT or a PTT time, right? And it shows how thin your blood is. And if your blood is thin, thin, most likely it is due to a hemophilia if they're not on any medications at all. And they'll be checking, then they'll be looking for the factor eight factor and seeing, do you have enough in your body? Um, you can diagnose it at birth, um, but um, usually, as I said, you'll see it later on. Um, as you see, usually not apparent in the newborn unless we see abnormal bleeding. 
Um, and can you imagine cutting the uh, umbilical cord and it bleeds and it bleeds and it bleeds? Um, you know, there's things, of course, that we could do uh, before we assume it's hemophilia, but, um, you know, a circumcision too. <laughs> so that's usually when we see it. As we can see, normal blood clots in three to six minutes and in hemophilia could be over an hour before it clots. You can lose a lot of blood. Many times when the kid gets a little older, it's nosebleeds that bring him into the ER or the doctor because um, they've had two nosebleeds in the last week, never had them before. So they, they come in and then we'll do a CBC and we'll do bleeding panels, PT, PTT. Let's see what's going on here. And of course, a really good history. Let's look what's going on with it. But um, in hemophilia, all of a sudden, you might be seeing urine in the blood. Um, you might be seeing, again, that um, epistaxis, nosebleeds. Um, hopefully, it's not severe headaches um, because it could be bleeding inside the brain. Um, swelling is going on from that bleeding that's happened. And that could get to the point of increased pressure in the brain, vomiting, and then, of course, getting disoriented because the amount of pressure that's in there. So, you know, the diagnosis, like I just said, how nosebleeds, um, you know, hematomas that just aren't the way that they should be. I mean, getting immunizations about two months, you give it, you shouldn't see any big hematomas. If we're starting to see these sort of things, two, four, six months, we get our first sets, right? So by six months, mommy stuff's gone. This is now the baby's. Guess what? Um, we're going to be seeing that bleeding going on. Now, the one thing that we try to take care of and prevent is hemoarthrosis. And that is blood bleeding into the joints. Um, it's irritating. It could damage that joint and it could cause it to die, causing crippling. Got to be careful with those things, okay? So if we know something's going on, somebody in a family is hemophilia, we're going to be checking that. We're going to make sure. Our goal is to home therapy, believe it or not, replace the factor. Kid fell down, bumped his knee. It's all ecumatic and swollen. They called the docs. They said, yes, go ahead. Parents give factors unbelievably well. I had a father who did it for a nine-year-old um, in the emergency room. And he said, can I do it? And I said, well, why not? Um, so I watched him and his technique was impeccable. I was really impressed. And the kid helped him pick the vein he wanted to use and everything. Um, and they administered it, it was great. And what that does, it immediately gets treatment and it stops that bleeding. I mean, initially at home, these kids are taught just like a broken or a sprained um, ankle, rice, rest, ice, contain, and elevate it. That helps decrease it. Of course, calming the kid down so they're not screaming and yelling, that heart's not beating, and then get that factor into them. Um, that can help. Now, sometimes um, there is a different thing besides factor, um, and it's the DDAVP nasal spray. It's only for mild hemophilia, the more severes do get the IV factor to let you know. It's hard for a mother and a father to have a child with hemophilia to let them go out and play. They're afraid they're going to go, they're going to fall down, and they're going to hurt themselves. Very hard thing, and you need to let these kids have some sort of independence. It's just like the toddler, right? When you have autonomy, um, versus inferiority. They, they want to do, 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 but the parents are saying no, no, no. And that could lead to a sense of not feeling good about themselves, right? So uh, again, same thing here. Let the kid be a child knowing what um, are the safeguards they need to take care of, okay? And if they're with other adults at a younger stage, the adults should know what's going on, okay? Platelet disorders, <clears throat> thrombocytopenia purpura is uh, one of the things, uh, thrombocytopenia is what we call 
a reduction of platelets. What did I tell you about platelets earlier? Platelets help with bleeding. Um, sometimes bleeding factors are all great. Not a problem. They're not hemophiliac. But all of a sudden they start, and this is what I've seen mostly with the nosebleeds come in, or they're saying, this kid's got bruises everywhere. The kid doesn't go out. The kid plays games 24 hours a day. There's no way he could have fallen. I don't understand. Um, so we're here um, checking it out. And it the purple is those little tiny little purple specks that you see. I mean, you know what ecchymosis, hematomas are, the bigger purpley areas, but they've got these little specky things going on too. It's something that can happen uh, somewhere between two to four years old. They think it's something autoimmune, which means this kid could have been sick a couple weeks, a month or so ago with a virus, and somehow it autoimmune attacked the blood, okay? So it is not a chronic disease. It's acute. We can cure this, okay? Some kids end up chronic but most we can cure, okay? So classic symptoms is that petechiae and purpura, uh, some sort of recent history of something, whatever it is. And they classify it as a platelet count below 20,000. Now, any patient who has for any reason has a platelet count 20,000 or lower you are going to put them on a bleeding precautions, which means if they ask for a razor, an adolescent to shave your, their legs, you're going to say, no, you cannot. You cannot get a razor, right? You're going to be soft toothbrushes. You're going to be monitoring for bruising. You're not going to give any IM injections because that will cause bruising and bleeding, okay? And the way we diagnose this it's going to be through a bone marrow aspiration, which means we go right into the blood forming place, pull it out, and let's see what's happening in there. So with ITP, what we do, um, usually uh, with these children, sometimes we're going to give them prednisone, okay? Sometimes they go away by themselves, you know, but most of the time they're going to be given IVIG and anti-D. Um, IVIG is an immune gamma globin. Um, it helps boost the immune system of the body, okay? And they're saying if after one year, they call this chronic, they might take the spleen out because it's not producing platelets the way it should. Um, so we're gonna get rid of it. So we'd rather produce, you know, give them what we do need, okay? And always, again, any bleeding, hemophilia, ITP, any of these. Remember, headaches, neurological assessments are important because they can stroke, they can bleed in their brains. No, ITP, you're already bleeding. So ITP, hemophilia, things, avoid aspirin, the phenobutazone and the phenacetin and caffeine. Um, also, because when they're in the acute stage, you should limit activity. They don't stop it. But if they're playing football, I'm sorry, they can't play football until this is cleared up, right? And usually, we don't just give the platelets back in an infusion. We let the body start working for itself. It's not like thalassemia. We don't do anything, but we're going to transfuse. Sickle cell, we're going to transfuse. But when it's ITP, think ITP, B for platelets, okay? So as I said, it's all bleeding precautions, right? Bleeding from the GI tract. Again, uh, putting those blood into the joints, hemoarthrosis, again, we don't want any damage to be done there. For, you know, ITP, if it becomes chronic, these children like hemophiliacs could end up in wheelchairs because they have absolute destroyed, you know, hips and uh, ankles and uh, knees with uh, bleeding, okay? Um, again, watching out for that intracranial hemorrhage. And um, we know that 
every single viral, well, not every, there's so many vaccinations today for viral diseases and it should be promoted because what causes ITP? ITP is caused by a virus. So influenza, COVID, those things um, should be uh, immunized against. So you have a nine-year-old boy are confused about their son's diagnosis and treatment for hemophilia A. They don't want to excessively limit their child's activities, but they are concerned about how to prevent bleeding and how to treat it if it occurs. What information do you give? Kids out there playing, falls down, bumps his knee, and there's a hematoma. What are you going to do? Somebody tell me. If you're bleeding, what do you do first? If you get an injury, what do you do first? Try to stop the bleeding. So we're going to do rest, ice, contain, and elevate. Yes. And contain means apply pressure. Yes, Sibby, absolutely. And again, these parents and a nine-year-old, you need to talk to the nine-year-old too. They are really responsible for themselves at that time. They'll make decisions on what they're going to do or not. And they should know better right and wrong, right? So white blood cells, most common thing is leukemia. You know, leukemia is two types. We have ALL, acute lymphoid leukemia. And then AML, it's the myelogenous leukemia or non-lymphoid. Um, it's all the other white blood cells, basically. And it's that they're produced, but they're immature. They're, they don't work. It's like a fragment of the cell that they need. And what happens is your, hemo your white blood cell, usually what, five to 10? I mean, every lab's a little bit different. But these, and that's five to 10,000. When you talk about leukemia, these children show up, get a CBC, because again, we're checking a blood dyscrasia. We'll do a CBC first, and that white blood cell might be 100. I've seen 100, I've seen 10, which means no white blood cells, guess what? No immune system. That means really susceptible for infections. So what, again, it is, is uncontrolled growth of immature white blood cells. Um, the bone marrow is completely disrupted. And we know that the white blood cells, um, they, you know, don't, they attack also the red blood cell area of production and they don't produce enough red blood cells. So now you've got white cells, non-existent, so your immune system's down. Now you've got your hemoglobin matocrit really low. So now you are tired, right? Anemic. You don't have enough oxygen. You have not enough iron going to the body. So you're not feeling well. Also, it reduces platelets. So now you're bleeding. So we've got a multi CBC problem here, right? White blood cells, red blood cells, and we've also are looking at the platelets. Usually what you see with this is, and I'll give you an example. My next door neighbor was 13, a girl. She was complaining of being oh so tired, had a fever, just felt ugh, everywhere. She was having some bruising and she had really bad pain in her knee. And she went to the ER. They did a CBC and her white count was 100. And today she's fine. Uh, she's actually a PhD from the University of Miami in psychology. So it doesn't affect you long term, but she had to go through intensive, intensive treatment. And for her, it was a sudden. Sometimes we see it gradual, but... Usually parents don't see it initially um, unless they're just getting, let's say, their you know, yearly labs and they see something. But usually we don't see it um, uh, unless we see some more symptoms, okay? So we know that with any blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, liver, spleen will become enlarged. 
Then with, again, we've got this stuff and these cells, you know, aren't existing. They're going through the liver. And now you're starting to see that pale, almost yellow looking. All right. And because of the platelets, low platelets, it's bleeding, right? Petechiae and purpura, we will see. And this child is not going to feel well. It's not going to want to eat, probably vomiting, fever, exhaustion, not eating, losing weight. And then the body, of course, hemoglobin, matocrit's not where it should be. They're dysmic. And they're, you know, they're just struggling. So you will see all those symptoms. Usually the diagnosis, again, is that history and symptoms. Yes, we can do the blood test, the WBC, and find it, but it's all the other symptoms of that it was my next-door neighbor who all the symptoms fit into hemophilia, okay? Um, they take x-rays. They look at bones. They look at everything. They do a spinal tap. They want to see the central nervous system. How does that look? Is there any malfunction there at all? Of course, with liver, uh, you got to worry about that. That's absolutely, they'll do some blood tests. And also the kidneys, make sure that they're working and they're okay with these, um, you know, malformed uh, cells. And um, we know that when we start giving chemo, we excrete it through the kidneys and it's metabolized in the liver, right? Excreted through the liver, liver uh, kidneys. So we want to make sure they're both working as well as they can so that we don't intoxicate our children with the chemo, right? So we can do radiation. Mostly I've ever seen is chemo. And the thing with chemo is, is there's, one, two, three, four, you have five different types of therapy or components. The induction period is an intense four to six weeks in the beginning where they hit these children with extremely um, potent chemo with the goal of completely eradicating the cancer out of the body. But you're going to say, well, I've seen that therapy go on for a year or more. Yes, because then they go into prophylactics and maintenance and um, trying to get rid of any little cells that were hiding, basically, is what that is, to keep it away. So um, it is uh, very intense for these children. They get those little ports in so they don't have to have that needle stick all the time. And it's right underneath the skin and parents are taught how to deal with that. They put numbing cream on before they come in when they know they have to be there. And one of the treatments is a bone marrow transplant. One of the things we give in chemo and it's a side effect is steroids. Remember Cushing's disease and they get all big and, you know, swollen face though. It could be a body image thing. Also, what do steroids do? It masks infection, causes fluid retention. How about elevated blood sugars too, right? That's part of it. Chemo, that stuff. Well, I always think of hair loss when I think of it. Uh, remember also nausea, vomiting. Uh, make sure we give those medications before um, they get the therapy. And also peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is just uh, like usually the legs and the hands. Um, they go like pain uh, on movement on them, it's just damage to the nerves. Um, also, remember, with all of this stuff, decreased eating, etc., we need to be worried about this constipation, as in they should be getting a stool softener during chemo. Again, levels are low. You also have to worry about their brain, right? Kids with leukemia usually feel very separated and isolated. They're usually in a room alone. Nurses are coming in with masks and gloves. And these kids, you know, just feel like they're aliens, right? Their hair is falling out. Um, it's, it's just a very difficult time. So make sure um, that kid has the ability to talk. If they don't talk to you, who do they talk to? Um, that you could sit there and understand them, you know, keep them busy. You know, you're talking about um, 
um, separation anxiety. These kids have it like crazy. They're scared. They have cancer. They know it. They're scared. So no white count. You have to be worried about infection. You have low platelets. You're going to be worried about bleeding. And we really need to take care of that mouth um, because it can get all um, ulcers and whatnot. So make sure that they do good mouth care. Soft, soft toothbrushes. Sometimes there's just these little swab things and they can work better than uh, toothbrushes, which can cause bleeding. And always, if they're in bed, they don't want to move, you know, turning them, giving them a back rub. I mean, giving a kid a back rub that you can see them, ooh, ah. Uh, but just remember, not too hard because you don't want to bleed there either. So a 13-year-old, the mother of a 13-year-old boy notices a painless lump on their son's neck. The physician diagnosed early stage Hodgkin's lymphoma. What anticipatory guidance should be given to the child and parents regarding the effects of chemo and radiation on developing adolescents? Well, Hodgkin's lymphoma, let's go back there. What is it? It's from usually the shoulders up usually the neck and the cervical area and the lymph nodes get big and they're visible they don't hurt they're just huge and that usually will bring the parent to the pediatrician with their child and they do a biopsy and they find the cells it's all right it's called hodgkin's lymphoma if it's a neck, a lymph node, they can put radiation and zap it right there. Now, one of the things about 13, you've got an adolescent body image, right? Radiation, they're going to be putting purple marks that have to keep there while they're getting the radiation therapy, okay? And we know that Chemotherapy, one of the big things, body image. I mean, this is a boy. We can shave his head easier than a girl, right? So making sure they understand what's going to happen and maybe make some plans for hats or wigs or something. What does that child want, especially if they're a girl? It really does affect their, their body. So let's go into some GI stuff now. Mouth to anus, we consider GI, gastrointestinal. We know that it takes the body and from the mouth to the anus. And during that cycle going down, stuff is absorbed and um, uh, broken down. And the body is able to take and digest the fat, the proteins, the carbohydrates and put it into the body and use it for fuel and nutrition. Now, there are several things that you could see with GI disorders. Well, one of them is what we call failure to thrive. Why would GI be a failure to thrive? Well, just because you eat it doesn't mean that your body broke it down into a product they can use it, right? So maybe that food's going in and right out. Um, I've seen several children, um, eight months old and are still 10 pounds, um, that these children have been fighting to figure out what's going on. You know, it ends up being the type of formula um, that's going on and they need to change formula into something that their body can um, use. Um, puritis. This is an interesting one. You have children with uncontrolled itching and you don't see any bug bites anywhere. It could be a liver dysfunction. You see that in the elderly too, puritis, liver dysfunction. And it's itching due to no reason, nothing at all. And all of a sudden they're just uncontrollably uh, do a liver function test, right? And we'll see what's going on. With GI disorders, I think vomiting, nausea, diarrhea are the big ones with constipation. Um, and then, of course, anything pain in the abdomen, bleeding, or vomiting blood also. So our goal is to make sure with everything that's going on in the GI 
that the food that they're ingesting, that they're getting enough of that nutrition so that they're going to grow and be cognitively where they should be, right? We want to make sure they get adequate nutrition. Also, again, we want to make sure that they do not have an infection. Um, some of these things in malnutrition are immune dysfunction. So again, preventing that infection. That's why do you think we know what goes on the first year of life, developmental delays. A lot of GI dysfunction we see at birth, that first year, it has to do with feeding intolerances, et cetera, et cetera. As they get older, um, you're going to see them not be able to run, jump, uh, that their uh, school level is below level. Again, they're not getting nutrition. Um, so looking for what's happening. Um, remember skin uh, problems, that puritis. Again, we're going to look for that liver. Um, if you have a child who is frequently having diarrhea, um, especially your infants, they're having diarrhea. Remember, they could be excoriated in that area. Something that we should look at and maybe, you know, ask the doctor, what ointment can we put there uh, to help with the pain, right? Can you imagine um, having such a red uh, excoriated perineal area and then having another stool, having a diaper on and letting that sit there? So these children aren't going to sleep much either. So you want to let mommy and the child sleep too. And again, pain always should be addressed. Now, tracheoesophageal fistula. This is when the trachea has an opening and it connects to the esophagus. The mouth does not connect to anything. It goes down to the esophagus and it doesn't connect to the stomach. So what do you see here? If I ate and it went down the esophagus, it doesn't go down. So it's going to come up and it's going to go through that fistula and into the lungs and the trachea. Big thing with this one is um, aspiration, aspiration pneumonias, because these children will be rendered NPO until this is fixed. These children cannot eat. All right. Imperforated anus. Can you imagine an infant born that does not have an anus? That means their intestines is not connected outside. That means it's got nowhere to go. So we know that these children are going to have to have some sort of surgery to open up and, and let that drain. Usually they put a colostomy on. Uh, sometimes um, with multiple, multiple surgeries and plastic surgeries, they can create something so that we can not have to have a colostomy. Um, I've heard that done also, okay? So when we have a child that doesn't have an anus, this is one of those that they're not going to be stooling at birth, right? I mean, we are told as nurses at birth, one of the things we do is a rectal temperature, right? That's part of the beginning as we're looking at the child. I think they do that to make sure the child has an anus. Do you know, in all my career, I've never seen one of these ever. Um, it's very rare, but again, treatment is put on a colostomy and then trying again as they get older to do something to repair it so that they can stool, you know, out their rectum the way it should be. Pyloric stenosis. You know, I love the picture of the dad sitting there looking at his baby and absolutely forcefully vomits in his face. Well, pyloric stenosis is the pyloric valve is thickened, narrowed, and at the end of the stomach, right before it gets into the duodenum, it can't go. So the baby eats. He's hungry. Eats. Eats. And he's okay. And then all of a sudden, daddy's looking at the baby and it comes right up. Forceful vomiting. This is the thing. Force. It's not a dribble. 
it's a forceful. Um, when I hear an infant young, they're usually three weeks to two months, right around there. Um, usually right about six, seven weeks is that sweet spot where I see most of them. This happens quite frequently, believe it or not. And these children uh, come in with vomiting. My first question, is it dribbling or is it across the room? And when they say across the room, I will say, okay, don't feed the baby anything more. And um, because all they're going to do is vomit again. One of the things with this vomiting, they're not getting fluid, depending on how long it's happened. You worry about dehydration. And you can actually put your hand right below the xiphoid process, a little bit in the middle, sometimes to the left a little bit. You can feel an olive. It's almost like a marble size. You can feel the thickened pyloric valve. So we know what that's going to be. They go to surgery and they do well. Celiac disease is nutritional and they cannot have wheat, barley, rye, or oats. So what can they eat? Rice. A child with gluten disease can have rice. When they eat stuff with gluten, they get severe severe abdominal pain, okay? As you see here, they usually don't have issues until we start introducing food, right? At six months. So between six months to two years old is when we start seeing the symptoms of that. So how do we treat it? We're gonna be putting them on a diet. Now, these children, um, you'll see atrophy of the buttocks and big bellies. These children don't uh, digest fat, so they have a lot of abdominal distension on them. So you will see those big bellies, okay? So we have classic, atypical, and silent. Um, and then you have latent. But classic is, you know, just the villi, these little hair-like things, these particles that suck up nutrients. They don't, okay? They're atrophied. The atypical is just a nerve problem. So they, the duodenum doesn't know what to do. And then there's a silent one that we don't know about. And it's, they find it by a perhaps endoscopy, right? And then some of them you will see like this is saying a wheat sensitivity all of a sudden you get a rash when you eat anything with wheat now infants because of this you're going to, and when we start that six months and feeding them you're going to see them they're really not going to you know gain weight the way that they should remember their small intestines doesn't absorb the amount of nutrients it should it doesn't absorb fat, okay? These stools are the terrible. They are large, bulky, and frothy like that right there. Um, it's quite impressive when you see it. Diagnosis, they do a biopsy. They look to see if, you know, what's in there, if those cilii are working. And lifelong treatment, again, is diet, diet, diet. You know, I worked with a nurse, and it was a gentleman, and his son had celiac disease. And the teacher used to let him know when there was any special parties. And this father, because he worked night shift, used to go and buy a cupcake gluten-free or make a something gluten-free and bring it to school so his son didn't feel different. And, you know, I thought that was a great thing because I took care of him one day. Somehow he got into something wrong and he was in there with abdominal pain and we became good buddies. So anyway, they need to avoid those foods. Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung's disease is a big outpatching of the lower, the distal, large intestines, and there's no nerves. Ganglionic is not there. Ganglionic is nerves, absence of ganglionic, which means no peristalsis, nothing's going on, all right? So it's called a megacolon. 
you know, this is um, absolutely nothing is an obstruction. This is uh, nothing's going by. Now, at the end of the intestine, usually it's very tiny, okay? Big out patch where everything is collecting, you know, whether it is milk or just mucus, it's collecting there because it can't move. There's no nerves to make it move. And then there's a tiny little thing that comes out the rectum. And sometimes it's like frosting coming out of one of those frostings, making like the swirls on a cake. You're going to see like little ribbon, like tiny little stools. When we see this, um, these children, again, um, need a way to stool normally because that will just get bigger and bigger. And it doesn't hurt because there's no nerves in it. More often in boys and Down syndrome. So you can see um, these children will not stool in the first day or two of life unless it's tiny little ribbons that are coming out. Most of these are caught as newborns, but it can you know, be uh, a month later where only tiny little's coming out and the belly's getting bigger, which clues the pediatrician and the family something is going on, okay? Usually, that's what you'll see. So how do we diagnose this? Well, what we have to do is, number one, do a barium enema. Let's look at the GI tract. Let's see what it looks like. They take opaque liquid, they insert it like an enema up into the rectum, into the small intestines, and they take a picture. Basically, that's what that is. After that, um, they'll clean it all out, and then they'll do a biopsy. The biopsy will show no nerve cells. So that's going to tell them what's going on. And they'll do a colostomy on these children um, and remove that piece of intestines that doesn't work well. Into susception, I call this a telescope. It's like a intestines that all of a sudden a piece sucks into the other. So you have an intestine and it sucks in, which means now it can't get through. It's just doubled up, kinked, and nothing can get through. Um, one of the things is this is a symptom. It's sudden, sudden onset these kids are screaming. It hurts so bad. These are toddlers usually is what I've seen them in. If you look inside their diaper, you might see some current jelly, like jelly, like maybe a little blood streaks in it, but like tip, uh, pale, tan, white with a streak of blood, but jelly looking. I'm like, mm, this is what this is. Um, and what they have to do is to... Um, Usually, if they go in, they do the ultrasound, they find it, um, they're going to have to do a surgery. Sometimes you can feel it, sometimes you can't. Sometimes they take a and do a reduction by doing not a barium enema, an air enema, where they try to pop open with air. They The radiologist pumps in air under fluoroscopy and the intestines pops out. And that will stop them from having surgery. I've seen one kid have to go to surgery. I've seen three kids have an air embolus, the uh, air enema done uh, successfully. And then I've seen other ones that come there to the ER. Yes, they were um, into susception, all the signs, all the symptoms, and then all of a sudden they'd be fine. So it was popping in and out. And the treatment increased the fiber in the diet and the diet, just increasing the fiber. Now, mechal di uh, diverticulum is in the small intestines, the ileocecal valve. And it is a fistula and it causes painless rectal bleeding. And it is seen more in boys. Hernias, I like putting my finger in those little belly buttons and squishing in and out. And that is a beautiful hernia. That's an umbilical hernia. It's soft. 
it's okay. There's no treatment to do. Usually we treat these and get rid of them and uh, do this surgery is for, you know, make them look pretty when they get older. They don't have this little hernia sticking out of their belly buttons, right? It could be hernia in the groins. I see that a lot in the newborn intensive care unit where they've been on ventilators, coughing a lot and straining a lot. And a lot of times the umbilical areas, uh, sometimes little boys will even go up into their, uh, their testes. Um, so inguinal hernias, umbilical hernias, um, it's just, there's an opening um, and the, the peritoneal sac is open and a piece of intestines come up. Sometimes we see them at birth. Most of the time they happen. I love it. As I said, they're squeaky back and forth. Things are great. But when you touch it and they cry or it's red and swollen, you cannot reduce it back where it should be. This is an emergency. This intestine had turned and kinked and no blood flows going to it. So we need to get this child to surgery as soon as we possibly can because it can burst and it can cause peritonitis, right? It's the intestines. Now, nurses conducting teaching and discharge planning for a the parents of a child who's schedule, uh, scheduled to undergo surgery for a GI disorder. What would you tell them? What do you think is going to happen to a kid who goes to GI surgery? What would you as a parent want to know? You want to know, know what they're going to look like after surgery. Where is the incision going to be? Right? Are they going to eat? When can they eat? What should they eat? Can they get out of bread? They want to know everything. Parents usually want to know even the small details, like what's important, getting them up and out of bed, how to take care of their pain. What are you going to give them? What should they do? There's so many questions in this, this, this little scenario here. I could go on and on for an hour. What are you going to teach? Remember, if you have a kid going to surgery for whatever condition, that parent wants to know how to take care of them afterwards. So you need to remember that and help them through these difficult times. A lot of times we give them the discharge paper, but we really don't go over it as in detail as we should. Um, these parents are going to be the primary givers. And we know kids go home really quick. So disorders of motility. You know, let's talk about diarrhea, right? Colitis, um, enterocolitis. Uh, it could have been due to bad food. Um, and infants is feeding them too much. Or maybe you made the formula and you left it out too long and or you didn't have proper refrigeration and now it's, you know, making that stomach not feel good. And then this, high amounts of sorbitol. That's, you know, usually we don't see that in infants. But primary problem with any GI issue, vomiting or diarrhea, okay? Dehydration is your enemy. Dehydration can kill a child more than an adult. Adults will tolerate it. Children do not. So priority problem is fluid and electrolytes. That's rehydration, isn't it? So can we give oral liquids to an infant, a toddler, a preschooler who's having diarrhea? Absolutely. They're not vomiting. They're not vomiting. Give them small sips of it. Keep them hydrated. Keep the electrolyte. Pedialyte for your younger kids. Powerade, Gatorade, whatever aid, you know, electrolyte solution of some sort. And that is going to help them from losing potassium and cardiac dysrhythmias and all sorts of stuff, right? So gastroenteritis, again, our big thing is, you know, keeping their fluid and uh, electrolyte balance, you know, good. Now, um, 
if they're admitted to a hospital because they're that bad, how do you measure fluid balance in any patient? Intake, output, daily weights. Daily weights, especially on children, okay? In adults, usually it's intake and output. We can see is more going out than going in. In a child, I'm telling you, dehydration is dangerous. It can kill a child. It can stop the kidney function, um, all different things. So making sure intake output. Also, remembering you, proper, you know, gloves, wear your gloves, wash your hands. Also, with the parents, discuss things about how, have them change a the diaper. How are they doing it? Are they washing their hands, et cetera? Um, making sure that they're preparing things in a clean manner and tell them those little things, you know, could have caused this, this to happen. Now, vomiting. This happens, remember, you're losing all of your acid that's coming out, right? These um, children, if they are uh, profusely vomiting, can't drink anything, we're going to give them an IV. If a child's vomiting maybe once and just a little nauseous, we might give them something antiemetic, like a Donstron, Zofran, right? Wait and then try little sips of things, all right? Now, in, there is... You know, of course, vomiting could be due to foods or some viral something. Um, also, remember that vomiting can also be related to head injuries, right? Any increase into cranial pressure. So uh, that would be part of something, you know, that we need to ask, you know, is has this child um, fell down, bumped their head, or have they been vomiting at home? Uh, have they had headaches, et cetera, et cetera, right? It'd be important. And whenever a kid vomits, you always worry about aspiration. Always, always, always. Now, if you're an infant, you're going to make sure you feed and burp them well. Um, sometimes it's gas that causes the vomiting. And you put them on their side, believe it or not. And that can help with um, aspiration and vomiting, you know, when you're there with them. And older children... You know, you know, turn their heads so they can get themselves into a bath, a bucket. I mean, I usually don't even bother with an emesis basin. You want to vomit, I'm giving you a bucket, so you're not going to get it everywhere and all over you. We know IV fluids might be what's ordered, depending on the severity. And when we decide that the vomiting stop, we've given that adonstron and that Zofran injection there. We've given that IV weighted time you know, giving them a little popsicle, they suck on it slowly and they're not like, you know, they're thirsty. These kids are been vomiting. They're thirsty. They want to guzzle. Give them a popsicle. They have to lick it slowly, right? It's one of the tricks that we do. Always document the color consistency, you know, um, again, was it before feeds, after feeds, or was it, um, where was it? Again, we're trying to rule out that neurological component. Also, antiemetics um, should be uh, given and th the response to that um, should be documented, you know, and how long you waited after to feed them, et cetera. Diarrhea, we've been talking about it. Um, one of the things about diarrhea, it could be due to all the things that I've already mentioned, but if it's more than two weeks in a child, especially your younger ones, it could be something to do with the food and absorption. So now the kid's not getting the nutrition. So it's something that does need to be re, uh, looked at really carefully. Um, always as nurses and parents teach them about those infectious, the viral bacterial parasitic, um, those are very contagious and it can go from around the whole house, right? Now, I love these pictures. These pictures are showing you dehydration to the max. The bottom picture, do you see that fontanelle? It's sunken way in. And the kid's just sitting there. That kid laying there, the top picture, look at those eyeballs. They're sunken in. 
And then what really breaks my heart, they cry and there's no tears. So these children, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, whatever it is, they're dehydrated. Um, you need to understand what are the signs and symptoms of that. In an infant, it's easy. You feel that fontanelle. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to also do a heart rate. Is that heart rate elevated? Well, that's going to tell me the other part of the story. But you see those sunken eyes and fontanelle. And look at the color. I mean, these kids look pale. Um, the kid on the bottom, even the ears are white. Um, the perfusion is nothing here. Um, you're also going to see those diapers. Hardly any wet diapers are you going to see. It could be 12 hours between diapers when a kid looks just like that, okay? And remember, they're losing from the mouth, they lose acid. From their rectum, they lose alkaline. So remember, they can go into metabolic acidosis with diarrhea and metabolic alkalosis when they're having vomiting. Now, constipation. One of the things about constipation in children, you know, this is something that um, could be the only thing that kids can really control, believe it or not. And a lot of times you'll see kids constipated Seven to 10 days, I've seen them go. Um, and they say, you got to be careful. Is there any stress going on at home? That's just a, a, one of those social psychological things, you know, that can cause it there. Um, but constipation is when they're not stooling it the way that they should. And uh, GI docs love to look at these pictures. Show me what does your stools look like? They say constipation is less than seven bowel movements in two weeks. Um, we need to look at what they're eating because we know maybe they're not uh, high in fiber. And what does the stools look like? Any medicines that they're on, we know if a kid is on opioids, right? For whatever reason, maybe that's causing constipation. So meds do make a difference. And then of course, um, when you encourage high fiber, make sure it's raw vegetables and fruits. Cooked have lost fiber. So seeing what raw stuff that the kid will eat. Now, they don't like to do enemas. They don't really like to give, you know, um, laxatives on children. But if it becomes something that's not working with everything else, they may. But it's the last thing is stool softeners. So fluid electrolyte. Well, we know intake output. We can watch it really close. I told you that dehydration is the worst thing that we can have in a child. Um, and it can cause up to and including death. Um, we know that... Um, when you have fevers, you're going to be losing a lot of it, right? So we have to make sure that we consider that when we're looking at giving fluid to your children. Now, fluids intracellular, extracellular, we know that. Um, we know that, uh, as I've said it several times here, dehydration happens really, really, really quick. Um, and so it's something that we should always be thinking of first with these children and um, sick children that don't feel well, that have been so dehydrated, you can't just replace it quick. You got to take your time and let them slowly build their fluid back up. OK, their heart's not used to it. Their body's not used to it. It's like a shock to the system. OK. And we know uh, children are less able to concentrate their urine. And we children need more fluids than adults, okay? So again, always making sure children are drinking. Electrolyte balance can also be something that we call um, hormonal. Give me one second. I Yeah. <laughs> 
I am sorry. My husband has my grandson picking him up. Uh, parents are out of town again, having fun. Anyway, so fluid and electrolyte imbalance can be dependent upon endocrine issues. The pituitary, the posterior gland, um, affects things like fluid balance. Too much or too little of the antidiuretic hormone. Uh, kidneys, of course, heart, everything. So when we're looking at fluid balance, we're looking at the body in total, okay? Fluid, signs of fluid of dehydration, you know, you're not going to see it immediately. And all of a sudden, it's going to be 10% of the body weight is gone and you're going to see it. And depending on how much is lost is depending on how you will replace it. You might replace it with just oral or you might replace it with IV and then add in oral later. Dehydration, there's three different types of it, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, and all of those will affect your intracellular, extracellular body. Um, we know when we're dehydrating, we'll boost the fluid in, um, depending on the child, and then we're going to make sure we're going to be given some sort of maintenance on these children so that they're getting at least uh, the minimum of what they need. You know, shock is big on these kids, and I've said that. And dehydration, one of the things, as I said, we wor worry about is always potassium. Potassium, um, if we lose it, if we don't have enough, what do we see? Well, cardiac dysrhythmias, I think, is the most severe. Too little or too high, both of them can cause it. So uh, we need to keep the fluid balance good. Now, sometimes we get too much. And it could be due to all different sort of things. Um, but uh, overhydration is when the body has more fluid than it can excrete. You're going to see a lot of interstitial. That means it goes out of the cells and it goes into the tissues and you're going to see all this puffiness. There are certain conditions that we see. I mean, I'm looking at that and... Um, I'm thinking of several things that it could have been, right? Um, we know that when blood is forced, it's fluid forced out into the extracellular places, usually the protein is not good in, inside the, the blood. And uh, one of the terms, anisarca. This is when you just get swelling everywhere. And as I said, it could be due to many different conditions. So what is an indication of overhydration in a one month old infant on IV fluids? So what did I tell you to always look at with infants? The output. Three. Bulging fontanelle. It's bulging fontanelle is the big one, but yes, you, you might or might not have an increase in urine output depending on where that fluid went to. But you're definitely, you do see those big bulgy fontanelles. Thank you. So overhydration, of course, intake, output, daily weight, monitoring close, monitor those fluid and electrolytes. And, you know, one of the things, if you have, there's hypertonic, it's too much, you know, uh, things inside of the blood, you know, which is pulling all the fluids in. And then you have, when you just give water, the fluid just goes where it shouldn't. So you look at the swelling all over. So um, depending on what the type would be, depending on your treatment, but understanding when they gain the weight and it's, having that swelling is what our job is, making sure the physicians know about it. Um, if there's changes in the urine output, because you know usually infants, normally on all of them, we do intake and outputs. Um, it's just a normal thing because they're so small and things can happen so quickly. And then, of course, as we're getting the lab results, making sure that we're looking at them. What is the potassium? What is the sodium? Very, or BUN and creatinine. What's happening? That failure to thrive is caused by, you know, different things. You know, I said earlier, usually it's some sort of malabsorption, metabolic. Uh, but also remember... We did cardiac, right? 
remember cardiac infants burn a lot of calories just by their heart beating. So they're not getting enough nutrition. That's why I would say maybe these children need an increased caloric count in their formulas. You know, normal formula that you give an infant, if it's formula, is 20 calories per ounce. We could go up to 30 calories per ounce and even more if we needed to in order for that child to get the enough um, nutrition they need in order to gain weight. Because remember, they're not gaining weight cognitively. They're not going to be where they should be either. Other things could be what we call non-organic. And it is usually neglect. I saw one case, one case. The kid was four, five, five years old. And the parents did not feed him. And if you look at that child in the bottom picture, that literally looked like this kid. He uh, came in, they brought the kid in. He literally, we he gave it to the nurse at the front desk, his son. The nurse looked at the child. He took his last breath. We brought him into the trauma room and we had to resuscitate him and fluid challenge him, giving fluid, fluid, fluid. The kid had been in a room, the door locked. He was tied to the bed, seriously. And this is not too long ago, guys. One of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. And um, I don't know at the last moment, the dad had a conscience, I don't know, and brought him in. Thank God he did. We did save him. I saw the child a month later and he was a little bit fuller. Um, he had like no fat muscle, nothing on him. He was just bones with skin covering it. And he had sort of pudgied up. He was alert. He was funny. He was grateful. He was thankful. Again, that's a neglect, and that's something that, of course, we did have to call in the authorities, and um, that child is safe today. Failure to thrive is just due to that metabolic type of thing. They are admitted to the hospital, and usually we'll start some sort of feedings, slow, continuous, getting that um, nutrition in there. Also taking all sorts of lab tests, finding out what's going on with them um, in order to get them built back up where they need to be. I mean, these kids with failure to thrive, they're not getting nutrition. They're not getting oxygen. They're, they're not getting what they need to live. So it's weight loss, irritability, vomiting, diarrhea. Their muscles aren't going to work it the way that they should. So our goal is to get that nutrition back in that child as safely and quickly as possible. We will be giving them all sorts of therapy to catch them up, right? Developmentally delayed. Um, there could be a problem. This kid is not gaining weight and the mother's trying and, and nothing's working. And maybe there's some sort of relationship there that we need to build or we need to help, you know, nurture. Um, it can happen. Um, sometimes, you know, it is that mother baby bonding that causes failure to thrive again. Uh, let's find out what's happening and let's do what we need to do to correct it. You know, as nurses, we don't have to do everything ourselves. It's not just us. Remember, there are therapists, there's physical therapy, occupational speech therapy, there's social workers, you know, all of these People are all going to be called in, the dietitian, everybody to help this child and everybody can get an opinion in order to figure out what we can do. And, you know, the child that I was talking about earlier, we changed his name and we moved him and put him into another environment. Um, even the grandparents wanted him and I don't know, they couldn't even get him. So um, I know that kid today went somewhere and I pray all the time that he is safe. So again, you know, if it's one of these, maybe it's a postpartum depression, who knows, right? 
um, always, you know, support the mother. Um, you know, the thing is the kid came in for treatment. They're here. The parent brought him in usually. Let's try to help that parent, okay? We know that um, we don't know long terms. We don't. We don't know uh, the way that they'll uh, outcomes. We don't know how long maybe they were deprived. So you got to, again, you know, these children need to be followed very closely. Um, and here, the inadequacies in intelligent language and social behavior, it does get um, with these children with that failure to thrive. I'd be very interested to know where that boy is today, you know, and how alert and cognitively aware he is. So an infant's admitted to the hospital for dehydration related to gastroenteritis and vomiting. The nurse observed the infant's mother immediately place the child flat in the crib after feeding. What would you do? You're supposed to do that? No. Don't we have to, you know, uh, pat them, burp them, you know, babies don't all burp by themselves, right? They need a little encouragement here. So um, this is something that we should encourage. How do you feed them and how do you prepare them to lay down? And most times right after they should be sitting up in a, one of those little chair things, right? For a while before they lay down. Babies don't eat and sleep right away. Not all of them. Appendix. Right lower quadrant with burning points, and that's your rebound tenderness, right? And it's that little thing between the small intestines and the large intestines that all of a sudden it doesn't want to be there, and it goes and becomes infected. So our goal is to get it out before it ruptures. Um, one of the symptoms... Um, it's very interesting. A lot of these kids, they're, you know, that five to eight years old is a great age for these, um, that you see a lot of them. And these kids will be walking down the ER, bent over right hand on the right lower quadrant, bent over, limping on the right leg when they walk in. And you go, oh, that looks like an appendix. When you put them on their back and you lift their thigh, they're going to they're going to bend up and scream and that's one of those symptoms you even pat the bottom of their foot and they'll scream it's just part of those symptoms that we see now yes we got to diagnose it for real we'll do an ultrasound number one and then we can do any other things that we need usually ultrasound blood tests we're still not sure okay a ct or an x-ray might be done Appendicitis, if it's diagnosed, yes, they do need surgical intervention. Um, and uh, hopefully they're still in pain when they went to surgery, which means it hasn't um, ruptured yet. And these kids usually go home the next morning. And if it's done in the morning, they could go home in the afternoon. That's how quick they go home today. And again, we're going to be teaching them about coughing, deep breathing and walking and slowly reintroducing the diet. Now, one of the kid, thing kids like to do is play out there on the dirt, right? And when they're playing in the dirt, their fingernails get dirty. And of course, their fingers are in their mouth. Everything's in their mouth, right? And a lot of times they'll get these little eggs and they'll go into their mouth and we'll see pinworms. Usually, we don't see anything until the night when it's dark. If you take a piece of scotch tape, and put it on the rectum and pull it off, you'll see tiny little white dots. That is the eggs. We will be given medications for these. Roundworms, these are bigger, okay? Um, but usually the stomach fills up with them and you're gonna see this cough. <clears throat> and there's really no reason for that, okay? Again, this is gonna be from you know, being outside. And again, we're going to give medications for that. So one of the things that we'll see with worms, well, worms are in their occupying space and they're making the intestines feel miserable, right? So um, those are all the signs and symptoms. Our 
um, what we need to do in responsibility is educate them all about, you know, washing their hands, keeping their nails short, right? So that they don't have dirt in their hands and possibly, you know, be carrying these worms into themselves. Of course, there are worms in food, et cetera. Always food safety is a big thing. Washing hands, always you know, refrigeration, et cetera, et cetera. Poisoning is a big thing. You know what kids love to eat the most? Flintstone vitamins. And they just go through them. Occasionally, they'll get into those chewable Tylenol tablets because they taste good, right? So number one, we need to make sure that we teach the parents to lock these things up. But they got into it. This child now is in your triage area. What do you do? Well, number one, um, we call poison control. We do vital signs and we call them up. And poison control has the most up-to-date treatment for it. And what's great about even in the uh, hospital, they'll call back and check up on that child, see how that kid is doing. Every home should have poison control number in there. It should be on your phones ready to dial in case of anything. Because sometimes um, it's that early intervention before hospitals, which save kids' lives, okay? All different things, do all different stuff. There are different smells that you can smell that look like stuff. You know, cyanide is extremely, extremely um, dangerous and it's deadly. So we need to know what did they eat, right? And um, call them. And what we'll do most of the time, is a little boy covered in black. There's something called charcoal. And it goes in, and it absorbs all of the poison if it's one hour or less than they took it in, okay? And it absorbs it, and then they're going to stool it. And remember, their stool is going to be black also. Um, but children don't like it. It tastes like charcoal. So we put it in juice, put it in Powerade, put it in a cup with a top that they can't see it's black. And the older kids give them a straw. The younger kids in the bottle, right? And we just try to get as much in there as possible. I'll say, take his clothes off, put a gown on. He's going to get it everywhere. I'll wrap them in towels because they will. And they'll spit it. Um, you're going to get covered too. So put yourself a gown on you too. Um, but this is what needs to be done um, to prevent that uh, absorbing. You know, we need to teach parents how to keep everything out of uh, reach, um, how to make sure that it's in an area where they can't get to. Now, Flintstones vitamins really don't do anything bad. What vitamins they don't need, they'll just urinate out. What if it had iron in it? Now, that's a different story, right? Tylenol, that's, you know, hepatotoxic. So there are things that are pretty bad. And sometimes they get into, I've seen them go up to um, mouse traps and take poison. I've seen that. We know the adolescents like the little tide ball things that became a big fad. Again, that is poison for them. So again, try to keep it out of their reach so they can't get to it. These are things they all normally get into. I told you what the most normal things are, you know, and some things, you know, like, uh, insect bites and snakes and stuff that we don't have control on. Knowing what plants you have at your house would be important. We know there is a higher incidence of lead poisoning in older cities like New York City. You know, lead paint used to be what everything was made with, painted with. And now we have layers and layers of paint in some of these older buildings. And what they do is they get up to the windows and they chew on the bottom sill and they're getting that lead in and you can become toxic. So one of those things is um, if we see a child doing that, get the kid away from it, get it covered somehow, that they can't do it, um, have them checked. 
Um, you also see kids eating weird things. You've seen all those shows on the documentaries. They eat toilet paper. They eat plaster. They eat, oh, well, knows what all the things. It's called pika. When they eat things they're not supposed to. And remember, if a kid is into those windowsills and it does have lead paint on it, remember, it can cause mental retardation. And sometimes it's the only thing you need to tell that parent. We don't see it usually immediately, but all of a sudden you start seeing symptoms when it's that lead poisoning, okay? You might just see that little irritability and vomiting, tummy hurts, maybe constipation, and then it can go up to the point of seizures and whatnot, and that's your nervous system involvement. Children like to swallow everything, and believe it or not, a quarter is what I've seen mostly swallowed by uh, children. Why not a dime or a penny, right? No, the biggest one, a quarter. They put it in their mouth because everything in their mouth, right? And something happens, they and they ingest it. Now, if it's a penny, a dime, that might be able to go through. And usually we'll take an x-ray and we'll just say, just give them a normal diet, come back tomorrow, let's see if it's passed. It can take up to six days to get through. If it's stuck, we have to go. And do you know if we take those things out today? We'll have the surgeon come down, sit in the lap of the surgeon, and we take a Foley catheter with a balloon on the end, pass it pat, you know, through the mouth, down below where that coin is, that quarter, blow up the balloon, have them sit forward and pull it out and they'll vomit and the coin will fall on the floor. I always tease that child. When that comes out, if I get it first, it's mine. So usually these children jump to the floor to get the quarter before I can get it. And he doesn't even remember why he was there getting it pulled out. He's worried about the quarter. He's not worried about this thing coming out of his mouth, okay? So a father brings his two-year-old to the ER. He's holding an empty bottle of aspirin and tells the nurse there were 10 325-milligram tablets in the bottle. How should the nurse respond? What did I tell you I do first? Well, let's take a quick set of vitals because I know um, infection um, poison control is going to want it. I'm going to be calling poison control and um, finding out what we need to do. Remember, aspirin is a blood thinner, right? So we might be given something to counteract that, but these children, um, that is a serious ingestion. So a lot of different stuff there today, wasn't it? I just saw some interesting uh, things. I'm going to quick do the cahoots. I'm not going to go crazy with it. There's 30 questions. We've got about 15 minutes and we'll be good for today. Remember, I will be sending you a recording for next week so you have information. And when we're doing it, um, that week nine after the exam, you can tell me, do you need to hear that information? Or uh, do you want me to just start doing some HESI reviews? We're doing a HESI review on week 10 also. So you can get, and there are two different ones. So whatever you all want, I'm going to work with you. I need more than two people, guys.
Anybody else coming on? All right, there's three. One more and we'll go. I appreciate you. Thank you, Millie. Thank you, Tia. I mean, these cahoots are so important. They've got such great concepts, okay? These are something you should be looking at and studying when you look at your exams. So which finding in a newborn is suggestive of tracheoesophageal fistula? Remember, this is when they're not connected. The esophagus doesn't go to the stomach. And there's also connection between the trachea and the esophagus. So it goes down, but it comes right back up. So this child's going to be uh, choking and gagging because it's going to be little mini little aspirations going on there. Okay. See a kid gasping, you know, gasping like that, that I would stop feeding immediately. A child's been vomiting for the past two days. What acid base imbalance would the nurse expect? Remember when you vomit, you're losing acid, right? So what type of balance would you see? You're losing acid, so what is left? You will see ABG type questions. Excuse me. So it's going to be alkalosis. You lose acid. What is left? It's alkalosis. Hereditary blood disorder that the body does not produce enough adult hemoglobin. And it's thalassemia. Hemolytic anemia is just when blood cells burst. That's what that means. And that's not usually related. They don't produce enough as hemoglobin sickles when they have sickle shapes. Why are rapid respirations a possible cause of dehydration? It's the other kid who's having respiratory distress. <laughs> They're breathing. Why is it a cause of dehydration? It's because it's all that mucous membrane is there. Very good. So again, giving little sips of fluid or IV fluids if they're in acute respiratory distress. What would the nurse expect the parents to report of an infant with a pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis is that pyloric valve is thickened, stuff can't get through, the stomach gets full and projectile across the room. Very good. How would you treat chronic constipation in children? So we don't do any of those type of, you know, laxatives and enemas. More raw vegetables, more raw fruits, not cooked. And then, of course, fluids is always a good thing. A child's been scratching the anal area and complaining of itching. What does a nurse suspect? <clears throat> and that's when you take the scotch tape test. And that's pinworms. Very good. What instructions will the nurse give to the parents about preventing the spread and in reinfection of pinworms?
keep the nails short and hand washing. Very good. Short nails is always one of those with children. Which food would the nurse recommend to include in the child's diet who is con has constipation frequently? Which one is the best? It's the whole grain cereal. Not cooked vegetables, raw vegetables. What condition is it characterized by pain in the right lower quadrant at McBurney's point? Appendicitis, great, good job. What description of a child stool characteristic leads to the nurse to suspect intussusception? So when the intestines go in, these are usually your toddlers. What did I tell you I look at and what should I see? <clears throat> That's current jelly, absolutely. Foul smelling, greasy, frothy, that's more of your celiac disease. What does the nurse expect the appearance of the stools of a child with celiac disease to be? Could be one or two of those, right? Bulky, frothy, loose smell, sm foul smelling, all the above. Actually, both of those answers are correct. A seven-month-old infant is admitted with diagnosis of acute gastroenteritis. What will be the nurse's priority goal? Remember the one thing about anything we're losing fluids, children do not tolerate dehydration at all. Prevent fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Yes, very good. After surgery for pyloric stenosis, an infant's hungry and crying. What's the most appropriate nursing action? As in, do you feed them or not, right? They just do one of these uh, pylorotomies. They just open up that valve. Things flow, can go through. And you just give small, first of all, small little glucose water. And then breast milk can be introduced quickly um, into after formula that will go a little bit slower than that. A multi. A child is brought into the ER with suspected appendicitis. What are some signs? So it's that rebound tenderness, right lower quadrant pain, and then you lift up the thigh and um, it causes the pain. Which statement by a mother may indicate a cause for a nine month old iron deficiency anema? So one of the things about young children is they need iron fortified formula or they need milk. They can't breast milk. They cannot go to regular milk till one year old. So absolutely that would cause iron deficient anemia. It's just deficient in the diet. What regulates how many RBCs are produced? So it regulates is the erythropoietin. Um, and, and that, again, remember, it's in the kidneys where it's produced. And remember that you see low hemoglobins with kidney failure. What information should the nurse include in a teaching plan about home care 
for a child with hemophilia A. If bleeding occurs, apply pressure, ice, elevate, right? And we're going to do the rice. And that's absolutely the first thing that they're taught. And then if they're taught already, home uh, therapy, if they have it. What will the nurse teach the parents of a child with a low platelet count to avoid? So nobody's going to be taking aspirin uh, children. The only time we give that chil uh, children aspirin is Kawasaki disease, right? So yes, we're not going to do that. It's going to make them bleed more. A child with leukemia has widespread purpura and a platelet count of 19,000. What is the nursing priority? So when you're talking about platelet count below 20,000 and you're seeing that there is that purpura or bruising, there's bleeding occurring somewhere. Number one, remember we worry about stroke. That's our biggest thing that they could be bleeding into their brain, okay? So number one, priority, are they awake? Are they alert or where they should be? I mean, the rest, okay, but it's that neurologic status. Which statement indicates an understanding of health maintenance of a child with sickle cell disease? So one thing is to prevent dehydration. Yes, because that's the cause that causes sickle crisis. Keep those veins open. Keep them warm. Most common cause of anemia in children. It's iron deficient anemia and we correct it by diet or iron supplements. What is the complication of repeated blood transfusions for a child with thalassemia major? Remember thalassemia major is the rectangle shaped cells. These explode and iron and O2 is lost and it's called hemosyndrome. Hemosedition um, is the, the biggest thing that we worry about. Not bleeding, just the cells is what we're talking about here. Hereditary condition where the blood does not clot normally. Hereditary and it's clotting, it's hemophilia. Thalassemia is the cells die quickly and they're rectangle. A recent blood count for a child who received chemotherapy shows neutropenia. What is the primary nursing diagnosis? What does neutropenia mean? Good hand washing, right? Risk for infection, low white count, very good. What type of cells carry oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood? What carries oxygen and carbon dioxide and iron? That's your erythrocytes. Platelets are there for bleeding, for, for putting a Band-Aid when they bleed. What can occur, what can occur iron deficiency anemia go untreated? If you leave iron deficiency anemia going untreated, what can it occur? 
So your blood levels are low. Your hemoglobinatocrit are low, low, low. What does the body do? Well, the heart's going to try to beat really quickly. So it's heart failure, heart failure, because your heart's trying to take over, trying to get that little bit of oxygen in those cells around. So it, if you don't replace that hemoglobinomatocrit, the heart will fail. A multi. What skin assessment would alert the nurse to bleeding for a child with a low platelet count? Skin assessments. <clears throat> Bleeding, what do you see if you're bleeding? You don't necessarily have to see bright red blood oozing everywhere. Yep, everything but lymphopathic, uh, lymphoadenopathy. What is the name of malabsorption problem that results in gluten intolerance? What is that called? Wheat, rye, barley, and oats. Can I eat them? There's a lot of rice stuff now. Rice flours and um, children today can be pretty normal with what they're eating. Just can't be the normal stuff. Has to be gluten-free. Very good. Last question. Hereditary blood condition where the RBCs are crescent shaped. And that's sickle cell. Thank you guys. A lot of good information there. So we have an S. We have a Tia. Millie. Good job, Millie. So that's the end of today. Um, remember, next week is Thanksgiving. And uh, Thanksgiving is a day for you to enjoy your family and your friends. I wish you all the best. Any questions, let me know. Um, remember, week nine is your exam. Review starts Sunday. I do mine Monday at 6 p.m. So whatever you need, you all let me know, okay? Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah Professor, day. can I ask a question, please? Sure. With regards to the math assignment, mm -hmm. 